The following podcast is with Paddy Manning. He's an Australian journalist who just published an unauthorized biography of Logan Royce. Oh, sorry. Rupert Murdoch's oldest son, Lachlan Murdoch. This is such a good book. The story of the Murdochs is even better and more dramatic than Succession would have you believe. The drama of the business deals, the personalities, the extravagancies of wealth, the politics. The Murdoch Empire is one of the most fascinating groups of companies ever assembled and the subject of this podcast, Lachlan Murdoch, is supposedly set to inherit it all. In this podcast, you can expect to hear about some of the real-life similarities between Succession and the real-life Murdochs, how Lachlan is himself a billionaire in his own right, the absurd luxury of their lifestyles, Australia, why Lachlan loves Australia, Paddy's opinion of Lachlan as a bloke, and then much more as well, including, interesting tidbit, how Paddy thinks that Lachlan Murdoch is most similar to Roman Roy rather than Kendall Roy. But there's a lot more to expect within the chat as well. So you all know the drill from here. While this podcast took me five hours to put together, it will only take you five seconds to review. So please swipe up Spotify, swipe up Apple and pump five stars, pump reviews into all of the algorithms. We've almost got more reviews now than we have episodes published. That would be a cool milestone to break. So please go in, Pump your good juice. Follow me on Instagram. I'm trying to grow the social channels over there, posting clips and and whatnot, uh, failing dreadfully at growing that channel. But with your follow, I'll be failing a little bit less so. The book is incredible. Patty is a terrific writer and journalist. And with no further ado, here he is. Okay, Patty. So I wanted to open up by asking actually just directly, what is your opinion of Lachlan Murdoch? Um, Because... My reading of the book was that it wasn't necessarily overly critical or judgmental of him as as a character. Um, And I definitely came into it thinking it was going to be sort of more of a, a, not an attack, but at least um, critical of the man's personality, his decisions and so forth. Um, So I just wanted to actually ask you directly, what was your opinion of him as a bloke? Uh, well, that's kind of open-ended question, and I suppose, um, yeah, I don't see my job um, in writing a biography of Lachlan Murdoch uh, to uh, be a critic of Lachlan Murdoch. I'm getting trying to get people to um, uh, give people the information that they can make their own judgments uh, about him, uh, and so I approached it not as a you know a bit of opinion or commentary or you know uh, much less writing a sort of a, a, a big long anti Murdoch rant. Um, I, I approached it as a job of um, trying to investigate, I suppose, who who uh, who he is. And I think to do that, you have to go in with an open mind, and I think you have to try and stick to the facts. And I think you have to do all the things that a, a ethical journalist does, and be fair and balanced and accurate and uh, give uh, you know Lachlan the right of reply to what you. Uh, do find out about him and try and you know get all sides of the story. So that kind of um, that kind of hard work, it would have been very easy to just write down um, you know my opinions uh, of the guy and not um, and not uh, do any of the hard yards, which is um, really do the research uh, involved in in trying to understand uh, what has shaped him and uh, and. And yeah, who he is and where he might where he might be taking this media empire that has such a huge uh, influence uh, globally. And you know, I have opinions about all aspects of Lachlan Murdoch. Um, I have opinions about his uh, you know uh, character, about his uh, business uh, acumen, about his politics. Um, and those opinions, I've got to say, are changing all the time. Uh, even since I've written the book, a lot has happened. Uh, you know, so I'm not wedded to any of them. I don't put a huge amount of um, store in my own opinion. Uh, I, I could respond to your question a, a million different ways. Um, I think one of the key takeouts that I um, intended uh, for people to, um, uh, you know, uh, get out of my book um, was that Lachlan is quite different to his father. Um, Rupert Murdoch has been a kind of, um, 
you know, Colossus in a way. Uh, he did found uh, f from the basis of, you know, one small uh, newspaper business that he inherited from his father uh, in Adelaide in um, South Australia. Um, he found it from there. He founded the world's first national global media uh, empire. And uh, people are quite familiar generally with the Rupert Murdoch story. But I think there's a there's a great uh, tendency to uh, tar all of the Murdochs, uh, you know, just think they're all kind of interchangeable, and uh, and and yet Lachlan is quite different to his father, and you know we can get into into some of the ways that he's different. But one of the key things that I think is different is that. Uh, Lachlan, uh, after, you know, uh, spending two years um, looking at and interviewing people close to him and interviewing people uh, opposed to him and, you know, uh, and doing as much research as I could do, I, I don't think that Lachlan is quite the kind of kingmaker that his father or grandfather uh, were. You know, um, I think Lachlan is... That's not to say that he wants to walk away from um, political power, but I think if you look at the investments that he's made uh, or driven um, over his, you know, 25 years since he was really, you know, actively involved in a, the business in a, in a significant way, um, and, and including the decade when he went out by himself, uh, I think the things that he tends to get interested in and invest in are not the things that his father, you know, pursued. Rupert pursued the Times of London. Rupert pursued the Wall Street Journal. Rupert created the Australian, the first national broadsheet. Um, these are huge uh, media assets that generate, um, you know, significant political power. And, you know, Rupert's model, business model, um, as one academic described it, Manuel Castells, uh, has been to trade, uh, you know, political favour for regulatory favour, and that's been a very successful kind of formula uh, for decades. Yeah, wow, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, but uh, but Lachlan Murdoch, uh, I think his his investments, whether it's digital real estate with realestate.com.au or whether it's commercial radio in Australia where he's made a lot of money um, out of uh, Nova, a company he bought off the Daily Mail and General Trust, um, and... Uh, or, you know, his current push into sports betting, uh, these are not things that generate political power. Um, and I think that shows that Lachlan's motivations are quite different to Rupert's. Uh, you mentioned so much has happened since. It reads like such a terrific drama, the, the, the whole story of his life, because it's always uh, just counterbalanced by big deals. His father is involved in, that involves him needing to move to another country deals that Lachlan himself is involved in. And you can just see how much has changed even since you published it. Um, Lachlan's favorite, Tucker Carlson, has been left the network. And there's a really, really interesting uh, line that you put in the book, which totally validated his ultimate axing, which no one could believe. How could they get rid of the biggest um, the biggest rating star? But it was the line was that uh, no one's bigger than the network itself. No one individual. Um, but you said uh, briefly there that you have opinions about his character that are changing all the time. Um, I wanted to see, and forgive me if it's too intrusive or whatever, but I would love to know, like, what is your opinion of him as a person, his character? Uh, well, um, well, I, I've, yeah, it's a bit hard to sum up, to be honest, Ryan, because, um, because... You know, I've written three biographies now, and um, you do have a sense of um, understanding a person, but at the same time, uh, I have not... I didn't interview any of them. All three biographies have been completely unauthorised and done without access <laughs> to the person. And... Mm -hmm. uh, now, if it had been an authorised biography and I'd shared a copy of the draft... Uh, with the subject, um, you know, I, I don't really want to do that. That's not an exercise that I want to get involved with. I don't want to um, give someone a power of veto over over the manuscript, you know, because I think that what the reader wants is the truth. They want warts and all, um, and and so I, I I haven't I haven't spent 
um, you know, meaningful time with Lachlan. I mean, I haven't, I never even got an interview, let alone having spent enough meaningful time to really with him to really feel like, okay, mm. I understand this guy. Um, I have, you know, I it's hard enough to understand yourself, let alone. Um, you know, your partner or your kids or your parents or, you know. Uh, so, look, uh, I think Lachlan has actually got a decent set of, by all accounts, uh, he's a well-mannered, uh, got a decent set of principles. Um, you know, one interviewer said, how can you write a book about such a monster? And I, and I just thought, that's ridiculous, you know. I said, he's not a monster, he's a flawed in- individual like the rest of us and uh and so i i don't i do believe that lachlan's main priority um is is to grow his business and his wealth uh i think that um you know he is less interested than rupert for example in sustaining um you know loss making but perhaps politically influential kind of media assets, mastheads or, you know, uh, television channel. He's all about, I think he's much more about the money. Uh, one of his, one of the interesting relationships that, um, that, you know, I studied and, you know, I did interview Lachlan's friend, James Packer, the son of the former um, media, um, you know, mogul in Australia, Kerry Packer. And uh, they have an interesting kind of parallel lives, um, in a lot of ways and you know both born into families of huge wealth and power and in the media industry and they do a lot of deals together over a they're kind of like twin strands of a dna you know they're like they they kind of uh parallel each other they come together um at times to invest you know in one tell famously which goes bust the you know mobile phone company um they invest in channel 10 which also goes bust so they actually have a pretty che- checkered track record uh, but they also invested together in real digital real estate, um, uh, which uh, turned into which went gangbusters. And okay, one lock James Packer. If you read his biography by a um, colleague of mine in Australia, a, a journalist Damon Kidney, he he kind of James Packer talks about his wealth as the scoreboard, and I think a lot of business people think that way. It's it's not so much that they're. Um, madly you know avaricious it's really that you know their sense of self-worth and you know their own uh smarts is is involved in what kind of return they can generate how much money they can make and um and really they don't need the money you know that it's like they're rich enough um, you know, Lachlan's about to take delivery <laughs> yes, of a boat that's, that's, that's so worth, rich. you know, something like two hundred yeah. million dollars. Uh, so <laughs> he, he, you know, does he need that boat? That's you know another, you know, four times more expensive than the last one. Uh, probably, according to you know, f- to for you and me sitting at a million miles from his situation, no, we we would say no, he doesn't need that boat. But he, but he wants that boat, and he he's earned that boat, and um, and. Uh, yeah, so, so I, I think Lachlan has, it has, um, you know, uh, you know, if you ask me about his politics, um, I, I would probably say he has a different, um, set of politics to me. Um, but, you know, uh, you know, and there's, and the other, the other caveat, um, is to say, I have concentrated in this book on Lachlan as the businessman. Uh, I have not really... There was a red line, and I think it's fair enough, around his family. Um, his kids are... Yeah, I think the oldest, his son, has just, you know, just reached adulthood. But they are not public figures. They're entitled to their privacy, and I had no interest in, in writing um, about them. I think that there may be some public interest in their careers... Uh, if they turn into a fourth generation of Murdochs who are kind of going into the media. And, you know, we have seen, um, for example, reports that 
Rupert's um, oldest daughter with his third wife, Wendy Deng, has already, you know, gone and done some work at the Wall Street Journal. So, and I think there is there will be huge public interest in in this fourth generation of Murdoch children if they are also going to go into this hugely influential influential business. And I think that's valid. But at this, but when I was writing this book, um, you know, in the middle of a pandemic, um, no one was, you know, doing internships or um, you know, the, the actually most of the newsrooms operated by um, News Corporation and Fox were um, were operating remotely. So you know, like there's um, there's uh, I think I have focused on the businessman. If I my opinion of him as a bloke, uh, I'd have to suspend judgment to be honest. Fair enough. Um, you it's a long answer. Someone... It's a long answer. Yeah. You want a short answer? But I can't... Is he a good guy to have a beer with? Apparently, he's a good guy to have a beer with. Uh, but I, I haven't had a beer with him. Yeah, he spent, like, his youth rock climbing, and he clearly loves traveling and diving and fishing and, you know, riding bikes. I mean, I suppose he's got all the hallmark stereotypes of what might be an interesting guy to have a beer with. But, um, you know, someone well, comments absolutely. to you in a previous and, you interview... Know, I mean, I did an interview with um, with Peter Frey, the former editor of uh, Crikey, an independent media website here um, that was um, uh, recently involved in litigation. Uh, Lachlan Murdoch had sued them for defamation. And uh, Peter Frey was telling me that when he first met Lachlan as a young man in the 90s in Sydney, um, he thought he was really cool. You've got to remember the young Lachlan came out to Australia. He'd grown up in New York, but he came out to Australia, had spiky hair, uh, tattoo, uh, was rock climbing, sailing. He was pro-Republic. He was anti-Pauline Hanson. He was a kind of nativist slash racist um, far-right politician in Australia. Um, and, and he was seen as being, you know, perhaps a new... He did represent something of a, a new generation um, and and maybe something more progressive. Um, you know, I, I think he's like a lot of people become more conservative as he got older. Um, that's pretty common. Uh, but, yeah, there was certainly was, you know, there was a kind of um, sense that, yeah, Lachlan was cool uh, back in the 90s. Uh, now he's sitting on, on the top of... Um, you know, perhaps the most controversial media company in the world at Fox Corporation, uh, and uh, and and he's a much more divisive figure. Yeah, someone mentioned to you in an interview, "How could you write about such a monster?" You know, I was prepared when listening to this story to just hear, um, you know, this privileged guy who, despite his mediocrity, ended up nonetheless in positions of great wealth and great power. But I actually ended up admiring him for lots of the book, um, you know, and I was like, is something wrong with me? You know, I'm not that politically conservative. I wonder why. It's, I don't watch any Fox. I don't read really any Murdoch papers or anything. I'm totally insulated from it all here in Sweden. Um, but I wonder if maybe you had that um, experience with multiple people actually sort of being surprised that hey, I kind of like this guy, even though I'm sort of told I should really not like him. Uh, well, to be honest, I did find that there were plenty of people who were prepared to um, prepared to uh, speak highly of him. I did find that. Um, and now, sometimes that was for obvious reasons, like um, he's a powerful person in my industry and I'm not going to say anything uh, that's gonna, you know, put me offside with him. Um, but sometimes, sometimes that came from some pretty surprising quarters, you know, like, I, I mean, I did go, you know, Lachlan's had a few, he's had a few major, what you'd say, major missteps, if not disasters throughout his business career. One of them is one tell. Um, a lot of people, even at a writers' festival I just went to in Adelaide earlier this year, a bloke comes up to me and gives me one of the um, one of the smart cards um, that uh, you used to be able to use if you. I think it had a SIM from OneTel. Um, 
uh, I think it was a SIM card for for a one tel mobile phone, and he had one of the last two that were survived. And the point that this guy was making in coming up and getting me to sign my sign a copy of the successor for him was that um, he lost half a million dollars in. He was a supplier to the mobile phone industry. He lost half a million dollars. You can't. This was one of the biggest corporate collapses in Australian history. Um, you know, more than half a billion dollars uh, blew, blew up. Um, and there were real people on the other end of that money. And uh, it was, you know, uh, it was also, you know, hugely, um, you know, that was News Corporation shareholders' money, a lot of it. And, uh, and, um, and so you can't, uh, you can't underestimate, you know, there was still people that are angry about, about what happened there, um, for sure, 20 years later. Um, but Lachlan... You know, Lachlan actually did rely on his friend James Packer um, to look after the financial side of it. Um, I, I spoke to one uh, invest one person who investigated uh, the uh, whether um, Lachlan and James, as directors of One Tell, had potentially breached their um, you know obligation breached their fiduciary duties as direct as company directors um being negligent effectively uh this person who um you know investigated investigated the whole collapse said to me i doubt if lachlan read a board paper and the point is there that this is a position uh where you know he is controlling hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in a way that no, you or I will not will not ever in our lifetimes, you know, direct that you know investment of that m- amount of money. But surprisingly, and you know, rightly or wrongly, uh, he was doing it on the strength of his relationship with with James Packer. James Packer beats himself up to this day about how that money got lost in one tell. Um, Lachlan, uh, I don't think does blame himself, uh, and. And he sort of got off lightly in, in the end. I mean, it was embarrassing and there was a lot of negative publicity and he had to endure years of, I mean, he had to endure a cross-examination where he said, I don't recall 800 times. So that that was probably not enjoyable. Um, and and the whole thing dragged on for almost a decade um, in terms of the legal process. Um, so I'm sure it was a pain. But, but, the, but in reality, Lachlan got off pretty lightly um, and Rupert, um, it was one of the things that was different between Rupert uh, Murdoch as his father and and Kerry Packer as James Packer's father. Kerry Packer was um, merciless and, uh, you know, it hot, humiliated James in front of the the rest of the, you know, publicly, you know, over the failure of one tour, whereas Rupert was very forgiving and... Um, and said these things happen, and we all take responsibility for the investment in one tell, not just Lachlan. Uh, everyone at News Corp signed off on that, and and we have to move on. And uh, and so I suppose that's a roundabout way of saying um, I did turn over every rock um, that I was could do in you know. I mean, I don't want to overstate it, but in the two-year period that I spent researching this, I did look at, you know, his culpability in a whole bunch of different areas, and I did not come away with, um, you know, any kind of bombshell uh, suggesting that he was, you know, corrupt, for example. Um, You know what I mean? It's like, I did approach the book as an open-minded, um, as an open inquiry. Um, I did do as much investigation as I could. Uh, and the picture that emerges is the picture that emerges. You know, I don't, if, um, if there are, if there are people who say, um, you know, for example, the culture at Fox News that led to Roger Rails and Bill O'Reilly and others, you know, the sexual harassment scandal that followed Gretchen Carlson, Carlson's allegations in 2016 and a sort of prefigurement of the Me Too movement. Was Lachlan partly responsible for the culture that uh, developed at Fox News? We're, you know, it's, it's, he is certainly responsible now. 
He's certainly responsible now as the C- as the chief executive of Fox Corporation, which is the ultimate parent company for Fox News. Uh, but was he at that time? Um, you know, in the lead up to 2016, when a lot of this uh, conduct, as was exposed, you know, um, you know, subsequently, a lot of this conduct had been going on for years. Um, well, it's a, it's a, it's a. Again, I, I, could, I would have to say, I, you know, I, um, Lachlan was on the other side of the world. Um, he would have. He was only race. He was. He was running his own investment firm in Australia. Um, he was a non-executive director of News Corporation. He um, was a non-executive director at this point too, I think, in Fox Corporation when it was split off. But but I I think it's a it's a long bow to say Lachlan was responsible for the culture of sexual harassment that grew up around at Fox News. Fox News was the fiefdom of Roger Ailes, and uh, it's the one area that Rupert Murdoch interfered in the least. Uh, you know. So, uh, look, I think maybe there was some advantage um, in, in having an, invest- an independent in- investigation into, into Roger Ailes and that it kind of quarantined the rest of the management of Fox News uh, from, from that, uh, from the findings, you know, in 2016. Uh, but, yeah, I think actually the ouster of Roger Ailes is sort of one of Lachlan's finest moments. Um, and when he, you know, when Megan Kelly calls him to explain that she too had been harassed by Roger Rail, she calls Lachlan Murdoch, and his first reaction is to say, "I'm sorry." You know, there, there's, there is, you know, yeah. decency. There's a mark of decency there, to be honest. And he took action. He, you know, he and his brother James, at that point, took um, strong, immediate action to get rid of the most powerful television uh, executive in their empire. And they've done something, you know. What, what one interpretation of what's just happened with Tucker Carlson is that they've that Lachlan has done the same thing again. Uh, you mentioned at the very beginning that maybe Lachlan is different to his dad Rupert because Lachlan's more just in it for accumulating wealth. He doesn't necessarily want the sort of um, political influence that his father might have uh, traded wealth for, for instance. And I'm sure that a detail about Lachlan that he's most proud of when people speak about the Murdoch children, where whoever on assumes is just, um, well, they are, but the most privileged, you know, go, nepo- uh, uh, going to be given everything nepotistically under the sun, nonetheless. But an interesting detail about Lachlan is that he's made over a billion dollars independently of his father through this investment company, Illyria. So um, what were actually the specific trades that made him so successful there? Well, yeah, so it's important to point out, um, you know, he he made that billion dollars. Um, and mind you, that the value of his private investment firm is not... We, we, they, they claimed, when I was writing the book, that it was worth a billion dollars. I think... Um, you know, that Lachlan was worth a billion dollars. I think that would be, that depends on, you know, the state of, you know, the financial markets and the media industry at any given time. Um, and those valuations are fluctuating. And so, you know, that includes the value of his, his real estate and everything else. But, um, and the sec and the second proviso is that, all the, so all of those valuations are private and we don't have, we don't have the, you know, we can't prove it. They can't prove it. They don't care to prove it. Uh, and uh, and we can't know. Uh, we, we, you can come up with estimates. But it's important to recognise as well that Lachlan got $150 million US out of the settlement uh, between uh, his father and his mother when they, uh, you know, when they divorced. And that took a long time to come through. It was 2006. And even so, uh, there was, a, there was a, a, a delay before that money came through. Uh, he quit the empire in 2000. He quit the, um, you know, his executive roles in the States working for News Corporation in 2005 after coming to, you know, he had a dispute with Roger Ailes and there were no, there were um, um, no love lost between them. And he also was butting heads with um, Peter Chernan, who was the chief operating officer at News Corporation and Rupert's right hand man. Uh, and he felt at that point in 2005 like his father was 
um, selling him out, um, that are undermining him because um, both those uh, Roger Ailes and Peter Chernin felt uh, that we're not going to be told what to do by um, Rupert's son and uh, and they um, were quite happy to go around Lachlan and they did uh, and uh, to Rupert and Lachlan felt that Rupert should have stood by him and he didn't and Rupert has actually later said that you know, it was one of the worst decisions of his life when he backed Roger Ailes over Lachlan uh, in 05, you know, in a otherwise con- seemingly pretty minor kind of dispute, but it led Lachlan to walk out uh, entirely. And so Lachlan took the $150 million that had been, you know, uh, given to each of the six, um, uh, each of the Rupert's um, six uh, kids by his three first three marriages, uh, look, Lachlan took that money and came out to Australia and invested it. And so it's one thing to say you're a billionaire in your own right, um, but you might you should acknowledge that you started with $150 million, which is not the way most people start. You know, so... Um, but, not bad seed but, investment. Hey? No, exactly. But it, but it does, it does, it does prove, you know, uh, or it does disprove the old, um, you know, saw about... Uh, rags to riches in three generations a uh, rags to riches to rags again in three generations you know the first generation makes it and the second generation builds it and the third generation blows it well Lachlan has not done that uh, and he's I, I can tell you the deals that you know I mean it's it's quite well known um, uh, you know that he bought uh, for example um, it took him five five years almost, by the way, because this was in the middle of the global financial crisis that, uh, uh, you know, Lachlan was just getting started in, you know, 05 to 07, waiting for this money to come because a good chunk of it came as shares. Uh, and so he didn't have all that money to invest straight away. Uh, and then he had to kind of work out, well, what did he want to invest in? And he spent, he spent a couple of years just kind of, um, you know, trying to decide what to do. Uh, and then, and then he, you know, had a few unsuccessful attempts like the CMH, this, um, you know, media business that he and James Packer lined up and then didn't, didn't buy in the end because the financial crisis, you know, scotched the deal. But, but, um, but what he did do in the end was buy half of, um, the Nova, the commercial, uh, radio network, uh, which has, uh, the Nova brand, and also Sm- and the, then also launched a thing called Smooth FM. Um, out of, so he had two national Smooth FM. I know it's quite funny. It's like um, I used to, Smooth Operator. My mum had that on in the car every day, going to yeah. to and from work and stuff. Yeah, hugely popular, very low margin, no political influence, but it generates a hell of a lot of cash. And it's on in a lot of you know dentist waiting rooms or taxi drive, you know taxis or uh, you know. Uh, wherever it's actually kind of uh, it's actually a good cash business it was neglected um it was the uh, daily mail and general trust dmgt in britain um was looking to offload it they'd probably overpaid uh and they were looking to offload it in the wake of the financial crisis and lachlan got a good price through his own relationship with um um uh with the family the harmsworth family that owned it and uh and he's um, uh, and so, so he's done very well out of that. I mean, that is by some valuations going by the, you know, multiples of other recent comparable acquisitions in the commercial radio space in, um, in Australia, that's worth more than half a billion dollars, maybe six something, um, what? as at the date a radio the, station, uh, radio network. Yeah. Yeah. It absolutely. Yeah. So, um, to this day, even though podcasting yeah, oh, no, you, no, you will away, have yeah, you will have people say that that's you know excessive, uh, but that's the valuation that um, that the Murdoch camp, that Lachlan's camp, point to. Yeah, they point to the value of HTE, um, and um, and so um, and then he also you know had a successful investment of a minority stake in uh, the Rajasthan Royals. Um, he had um, a disastrous investment in Channel Ten, uh, but. Yeah, he has... Um, An Uber? I mean... Oh, he, yeah. Uh, yeah, but that was tiny. Um, was it? Okay. Yeah, Uber was tiny. He was. He tried to buy Lonely Planet. That He got gazumped. Uh, the BBC ended up buying it. So, yeah. I mean, really, 
uh, in terms of his own private investments, it's it's really the the um, the investment in Nova. And but but we should also say there might be other things that he's invested in that we don't know about. Um, Interesting. Uh, okay, it's it's quite possible. So um so and then since that time, of course, in twenty seventeen, Rupert kicks off the sale of the bulk of um the Fox Film and Television um business, uh, along with um you know Star and Sky and Europe and sell, sells all that to uh, Disney and Comcast um for more than seventy billion dollars you know U S. And out of that, each of the kids gets. Um, each of the six kids gets something like two billion dollars in ballpark terms um, out of that sale. So, um, so yeah, Lachlan is um, made financially. Uh, whether he stays, whether he stays in the business, stays in the family business or not, uh, and and so that's yeah. I I do think that um, you know uh, Lachlan would. I I do have this. Um, kind of suspicion that um, it's no more than that, but um, I do have this suspicion that Lachlan can kind of take or leave uh, his his role working at at Fox or and News, and I think um, yeah, he he has shown um, when he moved to Australia and did his own thing for a decade, uh, he has shown that he's quite prepared to. What, it was a memorable phrase that he used during the phone hacking scandal, which was um, he would he would paddle his canoe in quieter waters, and and that's he was quite happy uh, being um, being at, based in Australia, uh, extremely influential here, obviously, uh, but yeah, not not involved and not certainly not commuting back and forth um, from Australia to the states as he's doing at the moment. Mm. Yeah, talk a little bit about his love affair with Australia because he was born and raised in New York luxury and UK luxury, um, yet nonetheless, you know, insists on living in Sydney. Um, and funny in the audiobook, whenever the narrator would speak, uh, would say something firsthand that Lachlan said, he would use an American accent, <laughs> which I find maybe okay. is like a subtle dig at Lachlan. Um, but yeah. Um, talk about his love affair with Australia. Why does he love Australia so much? Uh, I think he feels that, that that's the history of the company. Uh, he was the one who, I mean, he came here, he chose to come here um, after university uh, because he was reading uh, one of the biographies of his grandfather, um, Sir Keith. Uh, he was the closest of the Murdoch kids to his grandmother, Dame Elizabeth. Um and he is the one who uh, was most interested in the print side of the business, which is obviously, you know, the roots of the Murdoch Media um, Empire are in newspapers, uh, in particular in Adelaide. And, uh, and, yeah, Lachlan was the one who was most interested in print. Neither, um, neither Liz nor James, who's um, his two siblings from the second marriage between Rupert and Anna Torv, um, neither of them ever really showed much interest in the newspaper business. They were interested in music, they were interested in television, but they weren't interested in newspapers. So Lachlan had this um, had this uh, fondness for the print side of the business, and uh, and yeah, he he came out here as a young twenty uh, two year old, I think, when he first arrived, and uh, was sent up to Queensland. Uh, and he he loved it, um, and so he is the one that has spent. You know, I mean, Rupert hasn't lived here uh, full time uh, since nineteen sixty nine. Um, <laughs> he he yeah, he moved, lives in like castles in England and stuff, right? <laughs> yeah, so Rupert moves to England in nineteen sixty nine uh, with his um, second daughter um, Liz. Um, yeah, a toddler, and uh, and yeah, they they spend five or six years in London before they're moving to New York. But uh, but um, and and he's been there ever since, and of course, famously relinquished his Australian citizenship uh, in I think 1985, six when he was buying the Fox um, Television Network in the first place. So um, so but but Lachlan 
um, has been interested in being uh, in basing himself in Australia, and I think um, yeah, there's there kind of there's there are kind of layers to that, uh, but the people that I spoke to that knew Lachlan best uh, in the '90s said that when he had a sense of um, identification with Australian culture uh, that was kind of quite deep seated and and um, and really hit him when he when he when he moved here as a as a young man. Although he has, and he and he complains about the American accent. It's funny that the um, narrator has um, used an American accent because Lachlan hates his American accent, uh, and uh, or, or so he says. There's a much broader sort of tangent that I'd like to go into you with about Australia, but maybe, maybe one day in the future. I don't think we have time necessarily to do it properly now, um, but. Talk about, so again and again, we woven throughout the book and all of the anecdotes and the stories is just details of luxury. They are dripping in the most absurd luxury. So give us a sense for the lifestyle of Lachlan and his closest friends, you know, like even maybe give us a real estate tour, for example. Yeah, well, you you know, he's got... um still one of the things that generates that you know probably one of the biggest sto- biggest stories that Lachlan's ever you know the headlines that have still being generated from when he bought um the mansion Chartwell in LA in Beverly Hills uh in 2019 um that was um actually I better check if it's 2019 or 2018 but he paid 150 million dollars US for the Beverly Hillbillies mansion it was actually the one that was featured in the opening um it featured in the television show uh it it's um a massive um oh I couldn't tell you how many bedrooms it's got uh you know a courtyard for 40 uh, you know this kind of apron undercover uh garage for 40 cars it's got um, you know, incredible views back over LA. Uh, I walked around it with my wheelie bag, funnily enough. Um, I walked up <laughs> Bel Air Road so I could get a, have a look at it. Um, and of course, nobody walks up Bel Air Road. It doesn't even have a footpath uh, because um, because why would you? Uh, every every um, mansion uh, up there has got signs saying, w- warning you of an armed, you know, that you are being surveilled and um, that any, you know, there will be an armed response uh, to any intrusion. And uh, sure enough, I was, um, you know, as a journalist with my suit coat, you know, over my um, shoulder and a wheelie bag, I was pretty conspicuous. And um, there were people coming up in golf, um, golf uh, buggies saying, what are you doing? Uh, and I said, oh, I'm a journalist, I'm writing a biography, Lachlan Murdoch, he lives here. Um, yeah, and that's right. Well, okay, um, a bit of a jaundiced eye, but uh, yeah, anyway, I walked around it. It took about 40 minutes to walk around the perimeter of the whole thing. Uh, it's a huge compound of incredibly valuable real estate right in the heart of, you know, uh, Hollywood, uh, if you like. And, um, and, you know, the best most prestigious real estate in LA and uh and um yeah he probably got a bargain uh really uh even if it was 150 million dollars uh you know they'd brought it down from 300 or something what they were asking uh originally uh, it had been on the market for a while and then he's got in Sydney a similarly um uh you know palatial kind of residence uh at uh Bellevue Hill um, Le Manoir, which he's kind of was, was originally, I think, the French embassy for a while, and then he's uh, bought on that. And then, in each case, both in Sydney and LA, he's kind of added. He and Sarah, his wife, have added, you know, adjoining blocks over time. They bought, and Lachlan has bought um, a thirty million dollar boat shed just down the hill um, on Sydney Harbour, I think, at Port Piper, so that he's got somewhere to moor his, um, you know, yachts. Uh, uh, that's got a mansion on it itself. So all all up, I, I understand the um, the valuation Christ. of his you know his home in Sydney is north of a hundred million dollars, and uh, then he's got you know also uh, the Murdochs have still got Cavern, the property in 
uh, uh, on the Murrumbidgee, just sort of near Canberra. They've got uh, the spiritual home of the Murdoch family, Cruden Farm, outside Melbourne. Um, you've got, you know, a huge, um, you know, ski lodge that they've got in Aspen. You know, they've got properties all over the place. And, uh, and yeah, and the boats. I mean, uh, the boat that's being built right now... Um, is I think the world's largest carbon fibre sloop. Uh, it is supposedly 150 US million dollars, maybe 175. According to obviously the cost is being built in Holland, Royal Huisman, however you pronounce that. Um, you know, a massive 60 meter yacht. Uh, you know, Lachlan loves sailing. He's been a uh, he's been on the Sydney to Hobart three times. Um, so, and every decade or so, he seems to buy himself a bigger and bigger yacht. This one's got, you know, um, uh, yeah, just incredibly, um, luxuriously kind of appointed. It's the kids' bedrooms, I think, have a little, um, there's some little feature where the stars, um, you know, mapping the Southern Hemisphere, uh, come out on their ceilings or something. I can't, I can't remember. You can actually click on the Royal Huisman, uh, um, website and see a description of the building uh which is how the story got out originally as to what he was what he what he'd actually commissioned we're still waiting to see that boat it supposedly um hit the water i think it's on its it might be on its way to australia as we speak uh but um yeah then there's the private jets and then there's the cars and then there's you know i mean it does it is a um it is a incredibly privileged existence and you know even if you go back to where Lachlan you know the home that he spent the most time in in New York when he was growing up I mean you just stand on the street it's just opposite the Guggenheim Museum there Central Park is across the road um you know he has grown up with uh, an incredible um uh incredibly privileged kind of uh in an incredibly privileged environment the the feeling I had was um, the absurd, uh, excessive wealth that is featured in Succession, the TV show, actually does justice to, it sounds like, the lifestyle that Lachlan leads and presumably the rest of the Murdoch children. Yeah, yeah. And I think uh, Succession is a lot of, you know, a lot, a big, in large part, Succession is a commentary on that kind of wealth. Um, and, uh, and, yeah. It's not, um, you know, I, I did speak to, you know, when Lachlan first arrived uh, in Australia, um, he was thrown straight into the Super League war, which, um, you know, would mean nothing to anyone overseas, but it was when <laughs> the sport of uh, rugby league, which is the famously tough working class game uh, that grew out of rugby union, which is played around the world, but uh, rugby league is an Australian um, well, actually, it was an English game as well, but um, it was really <laughs> popular in Australia, uh, and uh, and it's famously brutal, and uh, and Lachlan loves the sport, uh, and I was talking to old, you know, for the football players at the time when they were negotiating, the Murdochs were trying to launch a new Super League that would underpin their um, pay TV business in Australia, uh, and also be global. Um, believing that you know rugby league was a um, marketable um, game overseas, uh, they tried to found this you know this international competition called Super League, and Lachlan was thrown into the middle of that. But you know the players themselves, um, uh, you know I was told when they were quite they were quite interested to talk to Lachlan. In fact, Lachlan Murdoch and James Packer were on op opposite sides of that. Um, d you know that whole Super League war, and um, and yeah, I, I spoke to one footy player who said that Lachlan was quite happy to when he first came out, quite happy to jump in the back of the station wagon, go and play touch footy, and um, have a barbecue with the rest of the team. You know, he w he didn't have tickets on himself. Um, as a young man, he was actually you know incredibly polite, apparently, and a very strict. Uh, strict mum and gave their kids, um, you know, pretty good manners, and uh, and so he he had a kind of you, you wouldn't say humility, but he did have he wasn't um, precious, happy to roll his sleeves up and and um, and you know uh, 
hang out with hang out with these tough rugby league players, even though he would have had no feeling for the sport when he first arrived. Um, and uh, yeah, so but I mean over time, uh, he's he's obviously got richer, and um, and he's got more you know particular about yeah. His uh, living circumstance. You know, he used to train with uh, Ian Roberts in Sydney. He used to go to the gym, you know, a gym in, you know, the inner eastern suburbs of Sydney. Pretty, um, you know, uh, by what I was told, pretty plain old gym. You know, he wasn't, um, when he was when he was younger, he was he was kind of a bit more knockabout. Mm. I guess all, spending all that time in Brisbane... Um, like yeah. no one, no one does anything else there except watch rugby league. So that's how well, it would have been. I think he was sent to Brisbane, kind of to toughen him up and throw him in the deep end, and that's what happened. Yeah. Um, so Lachlan clearly isn't Kendall Roy, but the TV show Succession, which is so unbelievably popular, is supposed to be loosely based off at least Rupert Murdoch and his kids making um, uh, the Succession. Who's going to succeed to take over the giant influential media empire? Um, what has, in your estimation, Succession got right just in terms of what are the biggest similarities between real life Murdochs and then the fictional Roy's? Yeah, um, there was a, yeah, Lachlan is most like uh, Roman. Uh, there's a kind of, um, flip that goes on most people think that because Lachlan's the eldest brother James is the youngest brother that um Lachlan must be the um Kendall Roy must be the Lachlan character and um and um Roman must be James but actually I think they flipped that uh because yeah James is the one who has you know made the kind of principled objections to uh you know fox news in particular and um and uh, over issues from immigration to climate change to you know election denial uh he has turned into kind of a principled critic and that was you know when um kendall roy works walks out of the business uh holds that press conference you know that was kind of a little bit uh like uh the kind of stand that um James had taken when he went off the board of News Corporation, uh, I think in 2020 or 2021. But, um, but uh, yeah, Succession, I think what Succession has got right, um, it's got a lot. I mean, there are plenty of people who will tell you that there's someone leaking from inside the Mur- Murdoch family to uh, the scriptwriters at Succession. And, you know, we saw recently Vanity Fair a report, uh, Gabriel Sherman, the biographer of Roger Ailes, reporting that, um, you know, Jerry Hall, as part of her, you know, Rupert's f- fourth wife, as part of her separation agreement, was um, asked not to be leaking uh, any any plot lines <laughs> to uh, succession. Um, I, I think the series has got a lot right about the state of, um, you know, American politics and uh, and you know we're just we're all watching season four right now um, and you know I don't know how it'll end but we've just had the election that you know a repeat of um, you know the Arizona the Arizona call um, that Fox News made in 2020 although the result in the su- succession series is um, is is that you know the Trump um, Mencken the um, Trump character um, does get elected, whereas in 2020, of course, um, Biden did. But uh, but yeah, I I think Succession gets a lot right. Um, but you know, it is it is ultimately fictional. I, what what I I think there has actually been for almost a decade now. It's been clear that Lachlan is the chosen successor of Rupert, and. Uh, and the interesting question, really, is uh, is what happens after Rupert dies. I mean, Liz decided early on um, that it was easier. She uh, quite a pithy quote. She said, "It's easier to be a Murdoch outside the family business." Um, and James has kind of quit. Uh, he was kind of tarnished in the phone hacking scandal, and he has, um, yeah, now quit uh, for other reasons. And Lachlan um, has has is kind of the last man standing but he's also 
he's also made a few good calls that that have have really helped that business. Um, and uh, and he has been the chief executive, obviously, of Fox Corporation since um, the end of 2018. And um, and so the interesting question is what happens once um, what once Rupert passes when the Murdoch Family Trust, which is um, the entity through which the Murdoch family controls um, both Fox and News Corporations. Um, Rupert has four votes, and each of the four elder kids by his first two marriages have one vote. And so at the moment, Rupert plus Lachlan equals five votes, and they can control the trust. Um, and regardless of what Liz Pru, um Rupert's daughter from his first marriage to Patricia Booker, uh, regardless of what Liz Prue or um, James might feel or do. And yet when Rupert passes, um, his four votes will expire and uh, and it'll be between uh, the four um, siblings as to, as to how what direction Fox and News Corporation go in. And what I reported out of my book, The Successor, is that um, the siblings are effectively biding their time, that um, there is a determination um, on their part to reassert control of the family business. At one point, the New York Times had reported that they were looking to sell to Rupert and Lachlan, uh, and be, um, so they were completely out of it. Uh, and... And that is no longer the case. They are uh, determined, I was told, uh, to to reassert control of the business and do it in a way that promotes and enhances democracies around the world. And so one analyst I spoke to said that, um, you know, it's fair to assume, I mean, I think it was an offhand comment, but I think it was a, it was a fairly significant one. He said, I think it's fair to assume that um, the day Rupert dies is the day Lachlan gets fired. And uh, that got you know, a lot of attention in the US media uh, when that, when that story, when the, when the book came out, because, uh, because that has clear kind of implications for the direction uh, of, you know, most importantly, Fox News, but also the rest of the empire. How has the book been received in Murdoch circles? Do you know if Lachlan's read it? Do you know what he thinks about it? Uh, I don't know if he's read it. Um, I suspect that he has, but, you know, I'm told that uh, he won't. Uh, you know, from my point of view, the main thing was I haven't been sued yet. Touch wood. I uh, don't. I hope that they. I hope that I won't. I was obviously uh, aware of the potential for litigation, um, and uh, and always have to be mindful of that when you're writing about the rich and powerful, and uh, and of course in this case I was also aware of that. And um, so far, you know, uh, there's been. Uh, I've had no threats of, you know, litigation, no corrections requested, nothing. So uh, I think I've done a pretty good job of getting it, of getting the story straight. Fingers crossed. And you actually used to work for Crikey, which was an organization Lachlan has uh, sued. So uh, I suppose maybe you feel a little bit too close to the fire uh, about it. Oh, well, I work for the Australian as well. But sorry, yeah. So what's the... There you go, both sides. So yeah. final question I try to ask every guest who comes on the show, if you could just describe the role that serendipity has played in, in your life. Uh, oh, I think I'm a big believer in serendipity, actually, to be honest. So, um, yeah, I'm quite happy to... Uh, this book was not my idea. Um, it was proposed to me by the publisher, uh, Maurice Schwartz, who owns Black Ink, which, um, and the monthly and the Saturday paper, which, uh, which is the, the stable that I write, write for most often as a freelancer, uh, and have worked for in the past and have written two books for them already. And it was his idea and, uh, and I went with it and I've not only gone with the idea of writing a biography of Lachlan because I thought it was in the public interest to do that. Um, there've been 50 books about Rupert. But I've, I've kind of followed that up with um, doing a uh, PhD now on the history of News Corporation because, again, although there's been many biographies of Rupert Murdoch, there hasn't been a proper history done of the company and exactly how was it able to build... Um, how was it possible that that company could grow from such a small beginning to such a huge globally significant business? And uh, so that's what I'm going to spend the next three years doing. 
and uh, and or two years, sorry. And so, yeah, I think that speaks to my commitment to serendipity. Actually, I've this is uh, I've been prepared to you know devote five years at least um, at least to understanding this family, uh, um, Lachlan Murdoch as an individual, and also the company, the business that they that they control. All right, mate. Well, um, hopefully one day I get to ask you about Nathan Tinkler as well, uh, an immensely interesting guy in Australian culture, but obviously we can't right now. Um, thank you for the book. I, uh, I really, you know, sincerely, not just saying it because you're here, but um, enjoyed it a lot. It was very, very easy to listen to and uh, fascinating. And as well, yeah, Lachlan's a really uh, interesting guy in Australian culture and I suppose world culture as well i guess or english speaking culture at least so yeah thanks mate really good book uh fascinating story thanks for giving me the time